Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked on Wolves. Today on the show, we're going to talk about the cap situation for the Wolves. What's the most likely scenario over the summer for Minnesota's roster, given all the constraints they're likely to have, given how they're currently constructed? We'll break that down. Plus, a couple of Wolves-related news items. Ownership, uh, Marcus Morris Ju- Sr., excuse me, and uh, also OKC loses on Thursday night. The Wolves are now in sole possession of first place in the West. We'll talk about all that. Plus, we'll preview tonight's Wolves Kings matchup. It's all coming. Welcome in. You are locked on Wolves. You are locked on Timberwolves. Your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Lockdown Wolves podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Lockdown Wolves. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Lockdown to get started. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy weekend and happy Timberwolves game day. The Wolves play host the Sacramento Kings this evening. We'll preview that toward the end of the show. Plenty to get to before then. However, uh, a big thank you, first of all, for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every single day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow the show on X at Locked on T-Wolves and also my account, which is at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C-K-E-N. All right, um, lots to get to today. I want to start with the Timberwolves cap situation. We talked a little bit about it following the trade deadline a couple of weeks ago, I guess three weeks ago now. Crazy. Um, Three weeks ago? Yeah, I think it was three weeks ago. Anyway, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that here off the top. Just kind of. And, and what prompted this is Keith Smith over at uh, Spot Rack, who does an awesome job uh, breaking down some, you know, cap numbers and things like that. I want, I want to give, like, he gives kind of a nice breakdown. So I'll hit that quickly, and then I'll talk about what I think the most likely scenarios are for the Wolves, and and so much of it hinges on how the rest of the season plays out, of course. But I want to kind of try to parse that a little bit. Then I want to get into a few additional news items for the Wolves. There's a lot going on right now. Um, as everybody, including the Wolves, are gearing up for the stretch run of the regular season. We'll close with a Wolves-Kings preview, which is a really intriguing matchup in my mind because I it's one that I I was worried about for the Wolves' sake early in the year. And sure enough, um, you know they lost the first game they played against Sacramento. But sitting here right now, this prof- the profile of this version of the Kings is different than what we saw last year. And I think you know it's not actually the worst matchup for Minnesota. So all that on the show today, let's start with the cap stuff. The short version is the Wolves are about to get expensive or are currently expensive. I think everybody knows that much, but the best way to put this is there's currently nine players under contract for next season, guaranteed contracts. Okay. They combined for nearly $184 million. The cap or the luxury tax line is going to be one 171 million next year. So the Wolves will already be almost $14 million over that and eh, almost $13 million over that next season. The second apron, which if you're over the second apron, the the repeater or not the repeater tax, the repeater is if you pay it multiple years in a row. The um the 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 penalty you pay for being at the second apron is going is is high. And we talked about this after the, the some of the some of the restrictions like you lose your mid level, uh you can't absorb more money than you're sending out in a two for one trade. Like for instance the trade the Wolves did this year where they sent out Troy Brown Jr. Shake Milton and brought back Monte Morris, they wouldn't be able to do that type of a trade as in season as a luxury tax team. Uh, there's also restrictions on trading uh, trading picks and pick swaps into the future, which matters because you know pretty soon here the Wolves will again at the moment be able to trade first round picks out to a certain point. Um, but currently their their hands are tied, and this would further tie their hands. Um, a couple important things here: one, that's if they're a second apron team, and right now. They would be butting right up against that. The second piece of it is you get until the end of the regular season in order to get under that line. 
So if the Wolves start next year over the second apron, they could shed salary during the season and get under the second apron. Okay? So that's always a possibility too. Now, of course, if you're right at the second apron, uh, well, I should, let me say this another way. They're at about one hundred eighty-four million next year for nine players. The apron is the second apron is going to be one hundred eighty-nine and a half million, according to Keith Smith at Spotrack. If they fill their roster with minimum players, so five minimum players to get from nine to fourteen, the minimum guys you need on your roster, they are exactly at the second apron. Okay, and that doesn't include the Anthony Edwards bump if he makes All NBA this year, which is starting to look more likely that he will. So. As currently constructed, this is a team butting up against the second apron, and the only way they would get underneath it is by trading out a window more. He's the most likely candidate, and taking back somebody that makes just slightly less than him. Like trade him for a guy who was picked a pick or two after him in the first round of the same draft, right? And and you'd save yourself probably enough wiggle room to not have to pay the tax at the second apron. It still completely hamstrings the roster otherwise. And you're still talking five minimum salary players to fill the rest of your roster. Now, of course, well, let's look at it this way. So of the nine guys that would be on the roster, only seven of them are in the rotation currently, right? You're starting five plus Nas Reed and Nikhil Alexander-Walker. The other two are Wendell Moore Jr. and Leonard Miller, who, of course, are not in the rotation. The two rotation guys that are unrestricted free agents this offseason are veterans Kyle Anderson and Monte Morris, who... um you know, Kyle Anderson's making what 11 or 12 million this out this year. Um, and Monte Morris is making eight and a half, almost 9 million. So Keith Smith at spot rack uses a filler. Like he said, he's estimated they'd each get around $10 million, which is probably about right. And one of the scenarios he supposes is the wolves bring them both back. I think it's pretty unlikely. They go that far into the second ape over the second apron of the luxury tax for slow-mo and Monte Morris. I think it's very likely they bring one of the two of them back and they pay something of a penalty because you need a, an eighth rotation guy that's not a minimum player. What I will quibble with about Smith's, I guess, analysis is he talks about how there's no young in-house options to fill their spots. And this would be at the moment if we're completely, completely nitpicking about a team that's first in the Western Conference. That's fair. We really don't know if the Wolves have somebody that could fill those spots. I be I believed coming into this year, in part because of the trade of Torian Prince, that the Wolves were prepared to allow Josh Minot to play some of these minutes off the bench, to play maybe some of the Torian Prince minutes, maybe be your 10th guy. We've seen him play non-garbage 10 minutes, I think, one time this year. And in that game, it was like end of quarter, um, you know, defense, like situational defense, right? So the Wolves don't know. I think they're pretty sure that Wendell Moore Jr. is not a rotation guy at this stage, at least not for an NBA team that is a legit title contender this season. Where the Wolves, like, in the play-in right now, they'd be exploring this, right? They'd be getting minutes for Minot and Wendell Moore Jr. Let's see what's going on here. They're the second-best team in the NBA right now. So they're not, they're not going to do that, right? There's not rotation minutes. They're not going to play around with Minot. They're not going to play around with Wendell Moore, unless there's some more injuries and guys dinged up and unless they lock into a seed late in the regular season, but you're not going to see extended run for either of those guys. So there are going to be tough decisions to make in the off season. I think Josh Minot could be a rotation guy in short order, but he's not Kyle Anderson. He may fill that role in terms of his size and the, the role in the rotation, but he's not about to distribute the basketball like Kyle Anderson. He's not about to be a team defender. I don't think quite in the mold of a Kyle Anderson. However, He's obviously bouncier. He's obviously longer. He's going to be a much better rebounder. And there's upside, of course. Defensively, I, like, I don't know that one-on-one -on -one he'll be as good either as Kyle Anderson, but I think he adds an edge to you defensively, or maybe not an edge as much as a, a, a an element that you don't have currently. So I quibble a little bit with that point because I could 100% see the Wolves bring it back Monte Morris for 8, 9, 10, 11 million. Know they're going to pay over that second apron. Let Kyle Anderson walk. You've got your eight, and your ninth guy is going to have to come out of a free agent minimum vet signing. It's going to be Josh Minot. Maybe it's a vet minimum signing of Jordan McLaughlin. I, probably not, because then he's your third point guard. 
it could be a, a two-way type guy, but I think you bring back one of them, gives you eight, you find that ninth guy, and then absolute worst case scenario, you play the buyout game again next year. And, and you say, hey, we've only got eight. It's kind of what Denver did this year, right? They let some guys walk. Uh, this, 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 the depth looks a little different than it did last season. And, and it's one of the things people are worried about with the nuggets is there just isn't that depth. And sure enough, they've had a, some injuries and their, their lack of depth has been exposed. Of course they won the title last year, so you can handle that, which is why I say, I think it really depends on how the rest of the season shakes out for Minnesota. I want to talk a little bit more about that before we flip into a couple of other topics. We'll close with the wolves bucks preview, all that, or excuse me, wolves Kings preview. All that's upcoming here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends at FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. There's a ton of fun bets you can do over at NBA, over at FanDuel, especially regarding the NBA. I've talked on the show before. I think that some of the, the, the odds for the Wolves to win the championship out there are nuts. In fact, right now, the Wolves are still, as of right now on FanDuel, only plus 2,500 to win the championship. Teams ahead of them. Are you ready for this? The Celtics, Nuggets, Clippers, Bucks, Suns, Thunder, and Knicks. The Wolves are eighth in terms of best odds to win the title, despite being second in record and third in net rating and number one with the bullet in defensive rating. I don't know how. They're behind the Thunder in the Knicks. I don't get it. It makes no sense. Absolutely bet the Wolves at plus 2,500 on FanDuel. I get why the Nuggets, Clippers, Celtics, and Bucks, and I guess even the Suns, although I, I'm not sure about that one, having them ahead of the Wolves. But come on. There's some opportunity over there. You can bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same-game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner, of the NBA. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube, and now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24 7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. All right, so the last point here related to the Wolves cap and, and why I think it really depends on how the rest of the season plays out. If the Wolves flame out, God forbid, in the first round, but even call it the second round, say it's a an unceremonious exit and not like a game seven, you know, buzzer beater against a good team like the Suns or somebody that um, people expected to be good anyway. Like, I think that would be a very disappointing finish losing the second round as a number one seed. But like short of flaming out in the first round or flaming out in dramatic fashion in the second round, if one of those things were to happen, I think then we go back to the conversation of like what would have happened in the fall had the Wolves or what would happen at this year's deadline if the Wolves were at 500 at Christmas time, right? Could Carl Anthony Towns be traded? Could Nas Reed be traded? Um, those are distinct possibilities that we could have had that conversation if the wolves were in that, in that situation, I think that gets revisited. If the wolves flame out spectacularly early in the playoffs, I think that's entirely possible. In that case, you can move forward without being a luxury tax team, or at least without being a second apron team, right? You know, back of the napkin math real quickly tells me that you'd still probably be in the luxury tax, but not much crazier than you would have been at the start of this season right before the Conley extension, before the McDaniels extension, which I guess got done in the summer. But um, by trading Towns or Nas, you're not going to trade both of them. The Wolves could manage that a little bit. I don't think that's likely. I don't think it's likely they lose spectacularly in the first or second round. If it's a hard-fought second-round series, conference finals, loss, call it, uh, You know, I think the Wolves kind of stay the course. And especially so, but there, you know, there is a little bit of an in-between, right? Like you might, you might say, ah, let's not bring back slow-mo or Monte Morris. We got to shake some things up. We need a little bit of new blood to mix in here. We think why not can do it right now. If they go to the finals or maybe they're on the doorstep, maybe they lose in the conference finals or maybe they lose in the finals. I think it's very likely, as I said earlier, one of slow-mo or Monte Morris is back. I'd be surprised still if both of them come back 
because I, I know why they didn't trade Kyle Anderson at the deadline because the, he still performs a function for this team, but there's also a version of this team without him. That's more dynamic. And I, I'm not convinced that that role it, I don't know that Josh Minot is that role. I'm pretty confident Wendell Moore Jr. is not. Do you go find somebody who, like, what you thought Shake Milt was going to be or what you thought Jalen Noel was going to be last year, that score off the bench kind of combo guard type player? Monte Morris is a little more like a modern Mike Conley or like a today Mike Conley than those guys, right? He's a little more like, yes, he can get his own shot, but he's not a dynamic microwave scorer like a Shake Milton was supposed to be, or Jalen Noel was supposed to be, or, or was a couple of years ago. So there's there's layers here. The most likely scenario right now is the Wolves are competitive in the playoffs into the second round, probably the conference final. I shouldn't say probably. Hopefully the conference finals. And they do some mixture of these things. They bring everybody back. One of Slow Mo or Monte Morris, probably Monte Morris. They bring in four guys on vet minimums. And they, they just know they're a second apron team or they're just under the second apron. If you can trade Wendell Moore, get off of that contract, maybe attach a second round pick and, and bring back a, a lower salary. I think those are the most likely scenarios for the Wolves, but it's obviously something to keep an eye on. It's exciting that we're even talking about this, right? Um, in the Keith Smith article at Spot Rack, uh, it's called, by the way, if you want to seek it out, it's called What's Next to Minnesota Timberwolves? I believe it's part of a series he's doing with a number of teams. But you can look at the history of how many contenders pay the tax. He says in the last 20 years, 15 of the 20 champions have paid the tax. The exceptions being the 06 heat, the 14 and 14 Spurs, 15 and 17 Warriors. And then most recently, the 2020 LA Lakers, the bubble Lakers team. Otherwise, all the teams have paid the tax. So like, it's very likely the Wolves will be in the tax, but it's a really interesting thing to, to monitor. All right. Let's skip right into some of these other news items. Um, the first one is Timberwolves ownership news. The original closing date, uh, well, the original closing date was December 31st of 23 for Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez to take over the, the final 20% of the Wolves, 20% uh, stake in the Wolves to get them to 60% as majority owners. That did not happen. They pushed it to February 29th, Leap Day, which was yesterday. Hasn't happened. Darren Wolfson at KSTP Channel 5 and Score North reported that Glenn Taylor uh, said that it wouldn't happen. And there it, there will be a new closing date set. So there's nothing really newsy there other than uh, Taylor did say something to Wolfson about how he hasn't really visited much on it recently with Lorian Rodriguez, which is interesting. Uh, but that they you know obviously fully intend to close and they're just going to push that off a little bit. So interesting. Um, I guess something else to keep an eye on. Another thing to point out that happened here is uh, Monte, nope, not Monte Morris, Marcus Morris wa reached a buyout with the San Antonio Spurs, which of course had been kind of in the works for a while, but there was some, I don't know, say animosity, but some um, history between Morris and the Spurs. Remember back in, I don't remember what season. A few years ago, four or five years ago, he had agreed in principle to a deal with the Spurs. They held cap space for him, and then he changed his mind and did not sign with them. Uh, he's finally now been bought out by the Spurs. There are limited teams that he can sign with. The Wolves are one of them that he's able to. He can't go back to the Sixers, of course, because they traded him. Uh, he also can't sign with teams that are above the first or second tax apron right now. Uh, of course, Patrick Beverly reported right around the trade deadline that Morris was going to go to Minnesota, but like he's got a sign today. If he's going to play in the postseason, the deadlines, the end of the day on March 1st. Okay. So whether it's Marcus Morris and there's actually some other guys that have recently reached buyouts as well. Uh, Mike Muscala got a buyout from the Pistons a couple of days ago. Um, he so he's he's still out there. Um, there's there's a couple others that happen too. So theoretically, the Wolves could sign Marcus Morris, although there hasn't really been much steam since then. So I I don't know that it's likely at this point. The Wolves don't at the moment have a roster spot available. Justin Jackson signed the 10 day deal last week, so I believe he's just got a couple days left. 
they could let him go like a day early, wave him or whatever, and then pick up Marcus Morris. That's theoretically still possible. Um, so we'll see. Uh, Patty Mills, for instance, uh, with the Hawks just got waived. Um, I, I mean, he's uh, he hasn't really played this year. I don't know. I mean, the Wolves obviously don't need him, but he's another veteran that just got put out there. So something could still happen today. And 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 I, I think it's unlikely. And whoever it is, they wouldn't be part of the rotation anyway. So I don't want to spend a lot of time speculating on it, but it's something to keep an eye on throughout the day here on Friday. I'll, of course, have thoughts on that. Um, on Twitter over the weekend, and then also on the show Monday if the Wolves do add anybody on uh, before Friday night's deadline. The last thing is the Oklahoma City Thunder lost to the San Antonio Spurs on Thursday. The Thunder are now a full game behind the Wolves in the West. The Wolves were a half game up before this, and the, they lost by like a significant margin. They lost by 14 points. So net rating-wise, things are tighter again. The Wolves are like within a half point of OKC in terms of point differentials. So uh, interesting. And also nice because it it hurts the Thunder when it comes to, um, when it comes to conference record, which is a tiebreaker in there somewhere. I always forget the order of them, but now the Spurs have both beat the Wolves and the Thunder this year. So, um, I don't know. Good for them, I guess. Good, for, good for, uh, good for the start of the Wemby era for them to get a couple of tough wins, which is uh, of course, Wemby's going to be a problem for years to come, but you know, good, good for the wolves to, to see the thunder lose to San Antonio. All right, let's close the show here today by previewing the wolves Kings matchup. We'll do that here next. Today's episode of lockdown wolves is brought to us by our friends over at prize picks. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. They're the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers. You pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch your winnings roll in. It's demon time on Prize Picks. You can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into a thousand bucks. Demons and goblins are the newest and most exciting way to play at Prize Picks. Squares marked with red demons or green goblins get you different payouts. You can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. Plus, Prize Picks offers injury insurance so your entries stay in play, even if one of your players gets injured. For basketball, if you have a player who gets hurt in the first half and does not return in the second, that player projection won't count against you, and the rest of your entry stays live. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. Go to prizepicks.com slash NBA. And use the code LOCKDOWNNBA for a free deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash LOCKDOWNNBA. Code LOCKDOWNNBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, let's close with the Wolves-Kings matchup. Um, have not seen Sacramento since right after Christmas time. Before that, it was right around Thanksgiving. It was the first game of the in-season tournament for the Wolves, or I'm sorry, the second second or third. I don't know. It wasn't the first in-season tournament game. It was their in-season tournament loss that knocked them out of uh, you know the potential to move forward in that tournament. Um, it was also the Wolves' first home loss way back on November, I don't know, 24th, 25th, uh, 24th. Have it right here. Uh, the Wolves lost by 13 in that game to the Kings. They then beat Sacramento in Sacramento by 12, their only visit to Sac Town this year. That was on December 23rd. So it was actually right before Christmas time. Um, the first time around, Minnesota struggled with the speed and the, the pace that the Kings play with. Uh, Darren Fox had 36 and 12 in that game, was huge in the fourth quarter, as he often is. Of course, the league's clutch player last year, Darren Fox, was. He did shoot 32 times to get his 36 points, uh, but he was relatively dominant in that game. Ant had 35 for the Wolves, 35-7-5, and and, and Cat had 27-11. It was a high-scoring, fast-paced game. The Wolves gave up 124 points. Again, the pace that the Kings played with was the biggest challenge. They also allowed Sacramento to shoot nearly 49% 17, from three, I should say. 17 made threes for the Kings. The Kings also out rebounded Minnesota. They're not, I mean, they're a good defensive rebounding team, but they don't usually grab a whole lot of offensive rebounds. They had 14 in this game against Minnesota. So a lot of red flags here. A lot of things the Wolves often struggle with. On top of that, 18 Minnesota turnovers, four each from Cat and Ant, plus three from Rudy, three from Nas, and three from Shake Milton in that game. And Minnesota just really struggled with the pace that the Kings play with. The next time around, when Minnesota went to Sacramento on December 23rd, 
That was a solid win for Minnesota. They built a 12 point lead at halftime. They hung on late. They did a good job against a team that's good at home. Um, and you know, ended up with a 12 point win. It was another big ant game, 34, 10 and five for Anthony Edwards, 20 for Jaden McDaniels plus four steals. This was a really, really good Jaden game. And on the King side, I mean, De'Aaron Fox was also very good in this game. 27 points on 23 shots. Keegan Murray had 20. He's been a little bit disappointed overall this season. Um, and Sabonis had a triple double. I didn't even mention Sabonis in the first game um, in the in the Kings win, but he had 15 and 11. He had a triple double in the second game. It was just that Minnesota jumped on Sacramento early. They forced him into a terrible shooting night from three. The Kings were just eight of 33. So first time around, Sacramento makes 17 threes and shoots 49% from three. Second time around, eight made threes, 24% from three. The volume was nearly the same too. So it was just a better job of contesting threes for Minnesota, just a worse shooting night for Sacramento. And uh, overall, the Wolves just took care, better care of the basketball. Six less turnovers in this game. They were a plus three on the glass. Um, just a more composed performance from Minnesota. I think the Kings should be a tough matchup for the Wolves, but since the last time we saw them, Sacramento's done some things that make me think it's not the worst matchup. They're still, you know, play at a faster pace than Minnesota, but they're only 11th in the league in pace. They're not playing as fast as we saw Sacramento play last season. Um, it's simple. Their nice. But overall, last season, they were just playing at a little bit of a faster pace. They continue to be bad defensively, which, you know, helps the Wolves who, who don't have a consistent offense. Um, they're only 20th in offensive rebound rate, which can be a problem. And they also don't get to the line very often. They're actually third to last in the league in terms of offensive free throw rate. So it's a team that the Wolves actually don't match up all that poorly with. Uh, three point rate. They're fourth in the league. They're twelfth in percentage. You can kind of see a tale of two different games there. The two times the Wolves faced the Kings already. Of course, Sabonis is a handful, but the Wolves have the size to deal with him. They also have bigs that can get out to the perimeter and guard him there too. Although Sabonis would much rather play out of the post, right? He only shoots one three per game. Um, so the combination of Gobert and Cat and Nas are actually pretty good matchups for him. Fox can be challenging for Jaden McDaniels because of how quick he is. And we've actually seen Jaden struggle uh, overall lately, even though he played really well on two, on Wednesday, excuse me, over the last, I don't know, call it since the All-Star break or even right before that, it feels like Jaden McDaniels has struggled a little bit to stay in front of really fast guards. Alexander Walker's great at it. So as long as Nikhil is on the floor, not in foul trouble, and of course he doesn't start, so the Wolves will start with McDaniels on De'Aaron Fox. But I do think they should give Nikhil Alexander Walker plenty of run guarding him. I think he's the best matchup for the Wolves against him. You could put Jaden on Harrison Barnes. You could put him on Keegan Murray, probably more likely when they're both when both Alexander Walker and Jaden are on the floor together. But I just think the Wolves will have more success if Alexander Walker is guarding Darren Fox. This is also a team that like I don't think you'll see Minnesota mix a whole lot of zone into because you don't want them to get hot from three. So it's really going to be hey McDaniel's go guard Fox. Alexander Walker, go guard Fox, um, use some combination of cat Rudy and, um, and Nas to guard Sabonis, make those other guys beat you. It's a very limited team. Like Harrison Barnes had a good season. He's not going to like, and he's a good three point shooter. He's not going to beat you off the dribble. Same with Malik Monk. These are guys that shoot more than half their shots from outside the arc. They'd much rather catch and shoot Kevin Herter, throw him into that same category. Um, make Keegan Murray beat you. And don't let Darren Fox and Demonis Sabonis beat you with ease. Make Keegan Murray beat you and at least contest those threes from Barnes, Monk, and Herter. Make those guys work for their shots. Make them shoot through you and over you if they're going to shoot threes. This is a very winnable game for Minnesota. I, you know, the Kings scare me because of what they can do in terms of pace, because Darren, what Darren Fox can do at the end of games. But it isn't as scary of a matchup as it was for me back in the fall. I should mention Darren Fox did not play on Wednesday. The Kings lost to the Nuggets. Um, I think they had an early lead and Denver came back and held them under 100 points, held the Kings under 100. Fox did not play in that game um, due to an ankle. So, or excuse me, a knee. So he's actually officially listed as questionable against the Wolves Friday. Ant is also listed as questionable, although Rudy Gobert is off the injury report. So that's a good thing, a good sign, especially after he seemed a bit hobbled and, and only played 27 minutes on Wednesday. But he's off the report for Friday. Fox did play Monday when the Kings lost on Monday as well. So Kings have lost two in a row. 
but Fox did not play Wednesday. So we'll see if he shows up um, and if he plays on Friday against the Wolves. All right, we'll have the live postcast on Lockdown Sports Minnesota on YouTube, and the audio feed will be right here, or I should say the audio of that show will be right here on this feed wherever you listen to podcasts late Friday. Um, after Friday's game, the Wolves do not play again until Sunday afternoon. It's a matinee against the L.A. Clippers. So that'll be a fun one. And it's also the front end of a back-to-back. So the Sunday matinee, then Monday night, they host the Portland Trailblazers. So the Wolves need to not look ahead to the Clippers. This is still a tough game in its own right. Winnable. They can win this one. The matinee against the Clippers will be tough. And then the next night, winnable against Portland, but another back-to-back for Minnesota. So it'd be awesome to see them close out this road or excuse me, close out this long homestand with three wins and go six and one on the homestand. I was hoping for five and two. Six and one is absolutely attainable. And it starts here with the Kings on Friday night. All right. That's all we have for you today here on the show. A big thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. You can also watch the show on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K E N. Of course, the Lockdown Wolves podcast is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.